Friends, a very, very warm welcome to the Church of Christ, the Cornerstone. It's wonderful to welcome you here on such a beautiful day. And it's a beautiful day in many ways. Sorry, my name is Reverend George Moore. I'm one of the ministers in this church. Peter and Penny, of course, who are members of this church for many, many, many years. I was saying it's wonderful to welcome you here on such a day as we, when we say farewell to our friend Peter Kings. And Andrew, and Andrew is coming in a few minutes with the family to conduct the service. But mine was first just to welcome you here and, of course, to point out to you the basic housekeeping if you've not been here before. I've seen quite a lot of people who have been here but for those who have not been here, as you came in on both sides of the reception, there are bathroom facilities for the ladies on the right and men on the left. Same as through those doors at the back, ladies to the right, men to the left, and again in the guild hall. We haven't, of course, any scheduled fire drill, so if the bells go on, leg it as fast as you can. <laughs> No, please don't do that. Please don't do that. If, if the firearm goes on, we will ask you to leave, of course, through the fire exit slowly. But this is not a day that is going to happen. We've, we've asked the devil to keep far away from this service this morning. So welcome, everybody. Feel free. And if there is any question, ask me. I'll be at the back. Or Simon, who is over there. We will be very happy to assist you.
Please do be seated. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will not die. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believed in him may not perish but have eternal life. Our God is a loving, caring and forgiving God and we remember that as we stand to sing Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways.
Please do be seated. As children of a loving Heavenly Father, let us ask his forgiveness, for he is gentle and full of compassion. We thank you, God, that you only allow to come to our mind the things that we have got wrong for the purpose of us saying sorry and to be forgiven. And so together we say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God our Father, forgive you your sins and bring you to eternal joy in his kingdom, where dust and ashes have no dominion. Amen. Merciful Father, hear our prayers and comfort us. Renew our trust in your Son, whom you raised from the dead. Strengthen our faith, that all who have died in the love of Christ will share in his resurrection who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just a fortnight before he died, we shared a wonderful afternoon when Peter gave us a highly animated and detailed rundown of every car he had owned. An array of beautiful sounding vehicles, the make, the trim, the registration, the colour all appreciatively described. And on that afternoon, if Peter had been charting his life for us, I suspect it might have been linked to vehicles. But let's start at the beginning. Peter Philip Keynes was born on December the 2nd, 1932, a sixth generation Lutonian, son of Philip and Babs Keynes. His cherished sister Penny arrived four years later. During the war, their father was based in London as a firefighter Peter could remember seeing the night sky lit up when the London docks over 30 miles away had been hit by enemy action, and also because of the total darkness, the Aurora Borealis. Peter's first school was St Gregory's. The very first day he was allowed to walk home by himself, there was a knock on his parents' door and there was a policeman with Peter's silver identity bracelet. And so Peter's vehicle chronology starts. For near the entrance to Wardown Park, he hadn't looked both ways when crossing the road. The car went straight through the park railings and ended up in the River Lee, and Peter went straight to hospital where he ended up for three months. And he could clearly remember the tricks train set that his father set up on the bedside table. In 1943, partly due to the war and possibly to do away with the need to cross any roads, Peter was sent to prep school at Molsis Hall near Keithley in Yorkshire. The first fortnight was horrible, but in spite of the deprivations caused by rationing and a family visit only once a year, he was happy there. One story we love, in spring 1945, the boys were issued with a banana each, the first Peter had seen since before the war. So he saved it for his parents' visit in the summer. <laughs> boys from Molsis Hall were recommended to the relatively new Stowe School, where the founding headmaster sought to run a happy school of independent thinkers based on Christian values. No fagging, no arcane names and there followed four incredibly happy years in which Peter's Christian faith was to be ignited. Those of you who know Stowe will appreciate 
that it is set in beautiful countryside, which Peter loved, and he told us of planting potatoes either side of the impressive drive. One of the Stowe stories he loved recounting was during his early days, when he and his friends kept ferrets. With the ferrets, they caught rabbits, which were much appreciated by the masters to complement their wartime meat ration. One Sunday morning, they went to a farm to look for straw for the cages and were caught. Farmer Davis told the boys he would report them to the headmaster and he asked for their names. One of the boys said, Smith. So Peter said, Jones. And the third boy said, Brown. The next day, at the end of assembly, the headmaster said he had been informed that Messrs Smith, Jones and Brown had been going to Mr Davis's farmyard for straw and he wished they would desist. Of the 500 boys there, three had very red faces. Peter left Stowe in 1950, having gained his school certificate with, to his surprise, a distinction in Latin. On the first day of his summer holidays, he was articled to his grandfather, Sir Thomas, to commence his career as a chartered accountant with Keen Shea Keens, the family firm. Peter, however, would have preferred a career in farming, <clears throat> and passing accountancy exams was a distraction from his devotion to hunting, the Young Farmers Club, and the South Hearts Beagles, which he became master and treasurer in 1962. He recalled very happy times organising meets, hunt balls, keeper's shoots and cricket matches, entertaining the farmers over whose land they had permission to hunt. By now, of course, Peter was driving and had owned two MGs, a Morris Minor with overhead valves, a Woolsey, an Austin Cambridge, and the jewel of his eye, a Lagonda. In 1954, Peter saw the film Genevieve, about the London to Brighton memorial run, and it sparked his interest in veteran cars. Peter located an 1895 Benz dog cart, registration BM56, which he cleaned up and entered in the 1955 London to Brighton run. It broke down in Crawley. <laughs> Through the winter months of that year, with a friend, Peter rebuilt the engine and they sailed down to Brighton in the following run in just seven and a half hours. Now, by this time, Peter was becoming rather well known at the examination halls. Having passed various accountancy exams at the second time of asking, Peter hoped to qualify as a chartered accountant before doing his national service. However, the Queen decided she couldn't do without him any longer, and he was called up to join the officer brigade squad of the Coldstream Guards. Although several years older than the rest of the intake, due to his years of beagling, he was as fit as any of them. It turned out to be a very brief period of national service. Peter contracted brucellosis, possibly brought on from drinking unpasteurised milk. He spent months on his back in Cambridge Military Hospital, returning to light duties, but invalided out six months after being called up. In 1964, Peter was driving a 3.8 white Jaguar with Pirelli tyres. His next Jaguar, blue in colour, was on order. But then he was reacquainted with a young lady he had known as a girl when holidaying on the Norfolk Broads with the young farmers. Penny accepted his proposal, and the new Jaguar was cancelled. <laughs> We're told that Penny's 20-year-old brother, Keith, felt it was a poor exchange. <laughs> Wedded in February 1965, we have one of the bridesmaids and two of the page boys in our midst today. The couple started married life in Whitwell, near Hitchin, when I was born, and they shared a Land Rover with no locking system. But in 1969, the youngest partner in Keen Shea Keens, Peter was moved to this area to be here as Milton Keens grew. And many of you here today are part of this chapter. Peter and Penny settled in Wiccan with me 
and so he was born soon afterwards. From our, our amazing upside-down house on the edge of the village, Peter was able to supervise the agricultural farming of the area. Weekends involved walks through the fields, beagle meets, and later horse riding with Zoe. Spotting a combine harvester always brought um, my father a deep sigh of appreciation. And in the late summer, he would take us on night walks to see the farmers combining, and in the autumn, to watch the burning of the stubble. And Peter was the night parent. Mum ran the show during the day, present for practical provisions as well as emotional support. But during the thunderstorms, the nightmares, the vomiting bugs that always seemed to announce themselves at night, it was Peter who we woke and whose bed we climbed into and who mopped us up. Mum slumbered undisturbed. <laughs> in 1973, Peter was appointed a magistrate to sit in the Stony Stratford Court. An active member of the Magistrates' Association for nearly 30 years, chairing both its Buckinghamshire branch and its training committee, he was involved in planning the new court in central Milton Keynes. One busy day in March 1992, Penny and Peter were at the opening ceremony of this church, attended by the Queen in the morning, and after lunch at the opening of the new magistrates' court, when Peter had the honour of escorting Her Majesty. His membership of the livery of the worshipful company, company of feltmakers in the steps of his father and grandfather gave Peter great pleasure. Joining in 1960, master in 1977, highlights were a Buckingham Palace garden party, which we attended as a family, the dinners he hosted with my mother at the mansion house, and celebrating the company's 400th anniversary by taking part in the Lord Mayor's show. In 2012, Peter was delighted to introduce my husband, Andrew, to the company, and it was a source of deep pride when he was later appointed chaplain. In 1965, my grandpa, Philip Keynes, had bought the Carline Bay Hotel Golf Course in Cornwall. When Philip moved to Jersey in 1978, Dad left Keynesshay Keynes to become managing director of the hotel. With its dramatic views over the English Channel from the clifftops, it had a special place in Peter's heart. And as a family, we spent with Penny, Ian, Nicholas, Richard and Charles many happy holidays there. In 1981, Charles and Diana hosted their duchy dinner at Carline Bay and my parents welcomed them. But as flights became cheaper, taking people to holidays in guaranteed sunshine, running the hotel, as a family concern, became financially unviable. Peter neg negotiated a sale that meant he was the only member of staff who left. He was remembered affectionately there for many years. Peter then became executive member of the Citizens Advice Bureau and spoke frequently of the marvellous volunteers he worked with. In 1984, Mum spotted an advert for the job of bursar for the first Bupa care home opening in Milton Keynes. She was convinced that Peter's experience to date, accountant, hotelier, administrator, would be exactly what Bupa was looking for, and so it came to pass. It was to be Peter's final and most enjoyable job. He cooked when the chef left unexpectedly, he laundered when they were short-staffed, he was licensee of the bar, and he oversaw the residents' financial affairs. The home was a success, and as Bupa acquired other homes, Peter travelled the country, putting in their accounting systems. But when he was 60, he could see a new world order ahead, with computers changing the landscape, and he decided to retire. Mum and Dad moved from Wickham to Stony Stratford, and after 12 happy years living there, they moved to Lovett Fields Retirement Village in 2012. There, Peter took up bowls, honed his golf with a number of different groups of friends and contributed as a volunteer until early this year. If we were tasked to sum Peter up in just one word, that word would be gentleman. 
and almost without exception, the, word, the wonderful cards we have received have said so. The small and large kindnesses that Peter extended, the genuine compassion and concern for others in every sphere of his long and varied life have touched so many people. Family was important to Peter. Penny, his wife of 59 years, he often said, I couldn't do without her. Zoe and I feel so privileged to have been his daughters. He was proud of his sons-in-law, Andrew and John, and devoted to his grandchildren, Emily, Sebastian, Charlotte and Felix. Before I close, I want to touch on my father's faith. It was a faith that presented itself quietly, yet dependably. My parents decided to find a family-focused church to bring us up in the Christian faith, and so there began many happy years of worship and involvement at St Mary and St Giles, Stony Stratford, including 25 years as bell ringer. And over the years, when Zoe and I found things challenging, Peter would often remind us to pray. Of his faith, Peter acknowledged that it was a journey, that it dipped and blossomed at different points. Faith is a gift. We exercise it and it grows. Faith follows facts and feelings follow behind. And the fact that in Christ we are offered forgiveness, peace and eternal life is a tenet Peter based his life on. In his last days, Peter was in pain. His decline was rapid. One morning he told Zoe he could see a red door at the end of his bed and it was being opened for him. And behind that door he knew he would find peace. I want to end with the words my second cousin recently wrote in her card to my mother. It encapsulates everything. I remember as a child riding in the back of your Land Rover, so cool, and heading for the heart of the countryside in pursuit of Peter and his beagles. I'm not sure I ever saw a beagle, let alone Peter. I could not see him, but I knew he was somewhere up ahead of us, completely absorbed and very, very happy. We now have a moment to remember our own personal memories of Peter as we have a musical reflection played for us by Adrian.
the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make your dreams your master, if you can think and not make your thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostures just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. John chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also, and whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We stand to sing the Lord's My Shepherd.
Please do be seated. Fenella has told us of Peter's love of cars, farms, the countryside, his generosity and his thoughtfulness. Recall the treasured, preserved and somewhat blackened banana. And remember too Peter's hunting with beagles. He was a strong, athletic and hard-working man. For Peter's 80th birthday I wrote a grace I would like to read you a part of it now. Father to Fenella and Zoe, and husband to Penny, man of good common sense and great friend to many. Born 80 years past in Luton, home of Hatters, an expert in golf and financial matters. A man we respect, who has served in the city, a hunter with hounds, most athletic and witty, helpful and wise, judge of character and court, a listener and hearer, and solid support. Peter truly was a man who had many strings to his bow or better said, wore many hats. He loved the poem If, and he truly encapsulated much of the content of it. He was definitely a man of resilience and determination. He was able to think straight and keep his head in a crisis. He was patient and honest. He had vision but was not dominated by ideas and dreams. He had stickability. He would see a project through. He had the will to hold on. One holiday morning in October 2000, I was staying with Peter and the family in Stony Stratford, and I knew it was the right time to ask Peter for the hand of Fenella in marriage. Penny, Fenella and Zoe were up in their bedrooms and I found Peter downstairs embarking on his morning chores, including cleaning his shoes. As I followed him around, seeking my window of opportunity, he was oblivious to my nervousness. He was holding on to getting everything done and completing his morning tasks. Eventually, I asked the question. He put down the brush and the shoe and he looked at me. And he asked me whether I could keep Fenella in the manner to which she was accustomed. I didn't think I could, but I said I'd try. <laughs> and then in place of the brush and the shoe, Peter went and picked up a tray and placed on it a bottle of champagne and five flutes and said, we must go and tell the girls. Peter could talk to people from and of every background. He could walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. He could fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. He held no grudges. He lived in the present, but he, but he had an eye for the future. He lived life to the full. And in that manner, the earth was his and he was a man. But not only was he a man, he was a fine gentleman in every sense of the word. One felt make a friend of him and of myself wrote to me recently and said, I was very fond of Peter and respected him enormously. It always struck me that the nickname that the company was given by Queen Elizabeth I, the gentleman, he actually personified in his life and attitudes. How we shall miss him. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. The earth was indeed his. 
But not only was the earth his, Peter also had a deep and lifelong Christian faith. He was a Christian man who was kind, generous, trustworthy, interested and interesting. He was fun to be with. He knew the messages of Christmas and Easter were true. God coming into the world and sharing our humanity and God forgiving our wrongdoings so that we can share in his heavenly eternity. In our gospel reading, we heard that Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to me, cometh to the Father but by me. Peter knew this to be true throughout his long life and he was reassured and encouraged by it towards the end. Fenella has told us how Peter knew in his last days that he was about to go to a new place, a place of peace and rest. And our reading from Psalm 23 tells us, Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, yet I will fear no ill, for thou art with me, and thy rod and staff comfort me still. Peter knew about farming, he knew about shepherding, and he knew Jesus, the good shepherd, as his own shepherd. He was quietly prayerful and faithful to God. He had no fear of dying and truly knew that the God he had served on earth had prepared a place for him in heaven. Jesus was with Peter on earth, and now Peter is with Jesus in heaven. Peter is now in God's house forevermore, in his new dwelling place. However, Peter's legacy, his example, his love for God, family, friends and others remains. And through that legacy, Peter will continue to inspire us to keep our heads when others are losing theirs, to hold on to truth when others deal in lies, to dream and not make dreams our master, to hold on when times are tough, to be a forgiver and live life to the full. Towards the very end of Peter's life, Peter and the family were blessed and privileged to have a doctor who cared for him, who is also a minister in the Church of England. And that man is with us today, invited by the family, Reverend Dr. Sam. Towards the end, Sam looked after Peter in body, mind, soul and spirit. He cared for him, prayed with him, and he took care of the family. So with great respect, I welcome Sam to lead us in prayers. I am humbled and privileged to participate at this service. Humbled because, as a GP, I witnessed the grace of God that was abundant upon Peter as the terminal diagnosis was explained to him. I observed his firm faith, his solid faith in a God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Peter knew his God, and God led him through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm privileged because as Christians, in grief we have joy, in death 
we have life. For God's love to us all, who gave us Jesus, who died for our wrongdoings, he died to set us free so that we shall live eternally. As St. Paul said, absent in the body, but present with the Lord. So we pray now together. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give thanks for the life of Peter, for the grace and mercy he received from you, and for all that was good in his life, for the memories we treasure today. Amen. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy upon Peter and all of us who mourn. Give them perfect faith in times of darkness. Strengthen us, O Lord, with the knowledge of your love. Amen. You are tender towards your children, and your mercy is over all your works. Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright. The time that is left to us here on earth to turn to Christ and to follow in his steps in the way that leads to everlasting life. Amen. God of mercy, entrusting into your hands all that you have made and rejoicing in our communion with all your faithful people, we make our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So join with me as we say the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A favourite hymn of Peter's, Abide With Me, we stand to sing. 